Hey guys, Claire here, and this is another installment of Subjectively Speaking. Today, we're going to rewind on one of our favorite franchises here at Subjectively, Pokemon, and talk about how the very first 150 Pokemon were designed from concept to console. Plus, we'll also look at how the small, unknown team of Game Freak developed Pokemon Red and Green, and how the series we know and love today almost died in development. Real quick before we get into the meat of today's video, take a minute to check out our sponsor, Inked Gaming. They offer a wide variety of high-quality TCG and PC gaming merchandise, which you can customize by uploading your own design or choose an existing design from a huge gallery of independent artists. Visit their website with the link in our description and treat yourself while supporting the team here at Subjectively. Pokemon. It's the most successful media franchise on Earth, a cultural phenomenon, and it paved the way for the popular video game subgenre of collectible monster games. The most recent series entries are the fastest selling in franchise history. Pokemon Go single-handedly popularized the new genre of augmented reality, and Pokemon toys, cards, and miscellaneous merchandise are everywhere. It's hard to imagine a time before Pokemon had such a dominant presence in video game subculture, but in 1990, it was just a long shot idea from a little known, newly incorporated game development team called Game Freak. Game Freak actually started out as a small video game magazine created by Satoshi Tajiri and Ken Sugimori in the 1980s. Game Freak, which featured Tajiri's writing and Sugimori's illustrations, found a special niche by providing press and strategy tips for the emerging Japanese gaming market. Tajiri's goal for the magazine was to connect players and developers in a way that had been previously impossible for Japanese gamers, and eventually, after years of reporting on and navigating the world of game development, Tajiri and Sugimori felt inspired to take a leap of faith and convert Game Freak into their very own video game development company. The newly reinvented Game Freak was incorporated in 1989, and development of Capsule Monsters, which would eventually become Pokemon Red and Pokemon Green, started a year later. About a dozen or so people were a part of the original Game Freak team, working together to make a new kind of video game. The idea for a collectible monster RPG was loosely based on Satoshi Tajiri's childhood experiences of collecting bugs and was further influenced by kaiju movies and classic anime, especially Godzilla and Ultraman. The Pokemon project was a massive undertaking. Though Game Freak first began working on the games in 1990, eventually greenlit by Nintendo as Pocket Monsters, the games weren't published until 1996. Six years of production is a long time even by modern industry standards, and the team's limited resources made development challenging. Game Freak tried to buffer their financial problems by working on various licensed projects for Nintendo, but the company failed to produce a hit and was forced to keep Pokemon on the back burner for much of its development time. In 2018, Junichi Masuda, a composer and programmer for the project, told Polygon that in the beginning, Game Freak felt more like a college club than an actual company. He said that staff would come in and leave at odd hours and they had very little structure. Despite this, people often slept over in the office because they'd work so long into the night, funneling all their creative energy into what was becoming a passion project for Game Freak. The same year, another interview was translated and published on Pokemon.com, featuring Ken Sugimori and two original team members, Koji Nishina, a data developer, and Atsuko Nishida, an illustrator and concept artist. They reflected on Game Freak's initial chaotic development of Pokemon as well. We didn't have enough people, so job categories were all jumbled, and we would really do whatever. I would make resources within the game, and programmers would make designs as well. There just weren't enough people, so we'd help each other out while working on other projects. That kind of thing. This collaborative attitude carried over to the design process of the original generation of Pokémon. Though Ken Sugimori was the lead designer, there were actually four artists working on character and monster design. Together, they designed over 200 Pokemon for Generation 1, from which they had to cut down due to issues of game balancing and a lack of cartridge space. From the initial pitch for Capsule Monsters that Ken Sugimori and Satoshi Tajiri presented to Nintendo, we can see the state of the game's art direction in its earliest stages, and how it evolved as Sugimori collaborated with other artists. 
The monsters overall clearly had a much stronger kaiju influence. Two monsters in a mock-up for the capsule monsters battle menu are very clearly Godzilla and King Kong analogs. All of the sprites we can see from this pitch are much more, well, monstrous and frankly kind of scary looking. Even Clefairy, Sugimori's self-described attempt at a cute Pokemon, is looking distinctly rough around the edges. As the games were developed more, the team at Game Freak realized that they wanted Pokemon to not just be about battling, but about collection, too. To make the idea of collecting the full Pokedex more appealing, Sugimori realized that there needed to be more variety in the Pokemon designs. Other staff members, especially the illustrator at Suko Nishida, were invited to have more input in creating Pokemon to make the designs more diverse. Miss Nishida wanted to design cute Pokemon to contrast the beastly, kaiju-looking concepts that Sugimori had already made. Nishida created Pikachu based on a Daifuku, and she gave it squirrely cheeks to store electricity. For this design, she was instructed to create a three-stage electricity evolutionary line, which prompted her to create Pikachu, Raichu, and a scrapped third-stage evolution called Gorichu. Nishida created a digital sprite of Pikachu before even making a sketch, so Pikachu's final design and its official art was actually kind of reverse-engineered from that original 8-bit sprite. Despite the apparent limitations, designing this way gave the art team an idea of the restrictions they had to work around as they continued to refine each sprite. Over time, the staff reworked Pikachu's design to be even cuter and more mammal-like until it turned into the absolutely amazing fat Pikachu we associate with early Pokémon today. As game data was being added for each Pokémon, it was decided that Pikachu would have a low encounter rate because Nishida loved it so much, and she wanted it to feel special when a player found it. Before launch, Pikachu was so popular with the staff that it was one of only 15 Pokémon that had its art printed in the Pokémon Red and Green player manual. Atsuko Nishida was also responsible for designing all three of the starter Pokémon. She designed the starters as baby forms of Charizard, Venusaur, which was Ivysaur at the time, and Blastoise, which had already been created by Sugimori. Nishida and Sugimori's collaboration resulted in the final, iconic, starter evolutionary lines. Around 1994, an official internal document called the Pocket Monsters Kaiju Illustrated Catalog was produced by Game Freak for both their own reference and as a tool to aid in discussing the project with Nintendo. The Kaiju catalog, which was like a printed proto-Pokedex, actually described 190 Pokémon that were originally intended to be in the games, though that number had to be further cut before launch. Actually, many of the Pokémon that were removed this late in development still famously exist as missing now in the game files, though most of their game data had to be removed due to the size of the games. Of the 40 or so Pokémon cut from the Kaiju catalog, many of them were third-stage Pokémon from lines like Pikachu's. Since a Game Boy cartridge could only hold up to about one megabyte of data, that's about one-third the size of your average iPhone picture, the team had to cut down the Pokédex to preserve game balance and use data efficiently. Through an in-house survey, the team decided that it was better to have a greater variety of Pokémon than to have multiple similar-looking evolutions. Some of the cut designs were added back in later games, though many were scrapped entirely. The file size of these games was actually so large that it presented numerous challenges to the development team. Pokémon Red and Green were developed on Unix computers called Sun, Spark Station 1s, an early work computer designed to compete with high-end Macs and PCs. At the time, computer crashes were very common, and the process of game development could easily overheat and crash these computers. Junichi Masuda recalls Game Freak going through three or four of these computers, which could retail between $9,000 and $20,000, over the course of their six-year development period, adding to Game Freak's financial woes. At one point, around 1994, the team suffered an exceptionally bad computer crash from which they were unable to recover their data. All of the Pokémon, the main character, essentially the entire game was inaccessible, stuck on a bricked computer. Masuda told Polygon that the team feared they would lose the entire project if they couldn't find a way to access the lost data. He, as one of the principal programmers, ended up throwing himself into research to find a solution. 
He called former employers, ISPs, and even went through the English language Spark Station handbooks, since the California based company Sun Microsystems had little technical support available in Japanese. Eventually, they found a way to recover the data from the machine, and after a close call, the development of Pokemon continued. Another hurdle the team faced was the downward trend of Game Boy sales in Japan. Sales had been steadily falling for years, and Pokemon's sluggish development was turning into a race against the clock. Though the Game Boy Color wouldn't be released until 1998, industry consensus in Japan was that the Game Boy was at the end of its life cycle by 1996 the year of Red and Green's eventual release. Despite the grim forecast of slowing console sales, it was too late for Game Freak to change plans. Pokemon were still being added, removed, rebalanced, and redesigned even as the release date approached, despite protests from Game Freak's debugging crew. The design team felt immense pressure to create an iconic Pokedex that would encourage kids to collect, trade, and battle Pokemon, not to mention to sell enough copies to save the studio that had spent six years developing a giant title for a declining system. Finally, their games were done. Or so they thought. At the very end of development, the programmer Shigeki Morimoto removed the game's developer debug mode from the cartridge, freeing up just 300 bytes of cartridge space from the otherwise full game. In that small amount of space, he added a Pokemon of his own design, Mew, as the 151st Pokemon. Morimoto basically added Mew as an inside joke for the development team, since it was not possible to find the Pokemon through normal gameplay. With this last minute adjustment, Pokemon Red and Pokemon Green finally shipped, and Game Freak could do nothing but wait. On release day, Junichi Masuda recollects that the entire development team simply walked around Tokyo's Setagaya neighborhood, where the Game Freak office was located, to personally see how their games were selling. He recalled that, since it was before the advent of social media, there was no way to get an immediate reaction from players, but they could tell it seemed to be selling alright. Articles on how to catch Pikachu, the first rare Pokemon to appear in the game, began to appear in strategy books, and kids seeking to trade and battle rare Pokemon, like Pikachu, with their friends began to bolster sales. The art team's goal of designing Pokemon to appeal to all tastes was starting to pay off. And then there was Mew. By performing a very specific glitch, a small numbers of player could summon Mew to appear in their games. This secret, mythical 151st Pokemon came out of nowhere with no explanation, and it seemed like the only way to get a Mew was by trading with someone who already had it. Mew became an instant playground urban legend and surrounded the Pokemon games with excitement and mystery. One manga magazine held a contest to legitimately unlock Mew in a few players' cartridges, and suddenly received over 80,000 entries. Word of mouth reached its peak, and Pokemon began flying off the shelves. The rumors surrounding Mew had spurred sales, and by the time the games were released overseas, Pokemon was a household name. Quickly, Pokemon began franchising. Production began on an anime, a trading card game, toys, and of course, Game Freak got to work on Gen 2. Despite all the roadblocks Game Freak had faced, Pokemon was here to stay, and it's still going strong, even now, nearly 25 years later.